It's great to see all of you this morning, and I really only want to take two seconds, maybe two minutes, to inter introduce my husband. I love Bob Barr as my husband. He's a great father, he's a great grandfather, he's a great uncle, he's a great son, he's a great brother. brother. But really what I want is him to be my U.S. Congressman. We need him in, congressman, in Congress because we need someone who has balanced the budget, who has cut federal spending, who has reformed welfare, who knows how to tackle uh, uh, executive orders from the president. Let me, let me ask you about your first job and think back to that. Did you feel like you were really contributing to your company that first week, that first month, that first year? I don't know that I feel like I did even until the second year. I didn't know who to go to in the organization that I could trust. I didn't know who to stay away from in the organization because they might lead me astray. I didn't know who in our business uh, environment I needed to touch base with and who not. We need to send someone to Washington who's not a novice, somebody who knows the ropes. I am sure that you all have heard of folks like John Conyers, who's the ranking member of uh, the Judiciary Committee, or Elijah Cummings, who's the ranking member of the Government Reform Committee, or Maxine Waters, who's the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee. All of those committees are the ones that Bob served on and would serve on again. Well, you've heard of these folks and seen them on TV. Bob knows them. He's fought with them, and he's beat them. And we need someone like that back in Washington. So I ask for your support for him, and please vote for him uh, in May. Thank you very much. No, not fair. Although I probably would too. Uh, there was a, uh, a little article in the uh, Marietta Daily Journal today. Uh, and the, whoever wrote it uh, said that we that the forum that we had uh, that the Cobb County Republican Women uh, Women's Club put on uh, earlier this week uh, Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, you know I was up there and I was talking about some of the same issues that, uh, that Jerry mentioned and some of the same issues that both uh, Governor Deal and Phil Gingrey uh, mentioned and talked about taking on Obama and taking on these other characters up there. Uh, but they, they also noted that during the entire, oh, how, how long was that uh, program, Derek? Two hours. Yeah, during that entire two-hour program, they said I didn't smile one time. <laughs> I am smiling. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there's a, a picture in my office that my former chief of staff, Fred Aiken, gave me when I served in the house previously. And it, had, it has this, this picture of an eagle, you know, full on, the, the face of the eagle with this, this beak and, and, you know, the eyes are peering out at whoever took the picture or painted it. And below it it says, I am smiling. You know, that's the respect I get from my staff. That's what I get. But anyway, there is not a lot to smile about with what's going on in Washington these days. Here, here. Yep. I don't know about you, but I don't find Nancy Pelosi particularly funny. And I don't find Harry Reid, also known as The Undertaker over in the Senate, because he's the man that never smiles, I don't find him very funny. Although we apparently do have that one thing in common. And I certainly do not find President Obama and his Attorney General Eric Holder the least bit funny. There is not a lot to smile about with these folks. They are the enemy. They are our target. It's not any of the folks here, it's not any of our candidates running for any of the federal offices. And I think as Nathan Deal said, it's important for us to keep that in mind. Where is the real enemy? The real enemy is the forces of liberalism in Washington that are entrenched there. And we have to fight every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year to make sure that they do not make gains and that we roll back the tide that they have been pushing for years and years and years and which have given us a deficit of 18 trillion dollars, almost 18 trillion. And probably all of us in this room know 
that that $18 trillion is just the tip of the iceberg. You look below the surface, you look down below, and you add in all of those unfunded mandates, those unfunded, I'm sorry, those unfunded liabilities, and I have listened to economic experts, and they tell me, and they tell us, and I think they're absolutely correct, that the real debt out there is in excess of a hundred or a hundred and fifty trillion dollars. We cannot continue down that road. It is already hurting us tremendously at home and abroad as well. When you go from being a creditor nation, as we were in those decades after World War II, to being a debtor nation, and I tell you, it's embarrassing to me when I read that Communist China is our major creditor. That is not just wrong, that is bad wrong, as they say. But when you go from being a creditor nation to being a debtor nation, you lose something other than simply the flexibility to make economic decisions in your nation's best interests. You lose the power to influence events all over the world. And we're seeing that now. Now granted, the reason that it is so embarrassing to see Barack Obama serve as our Commander-in-Chief and have people like Vladimir Putin walk over him and make fun of him, almost laugh at his face, goes far beyond simply the fact that we are a debtor nation. It goes to the very heart and soul of what a Commander-in-Chief should be. And everything that Barack Obama is, is what our Commander-in-Chief should not be. So there are major problems up there. And we need to keep in mind as we look at the federal races, the House race here in the 11th District and the Senate race, which certainly touches all of us in Georgia as well, including here in the 11th District, we need to keep in mind something that Tip O'Neill, a former Democratic Speaker of the House, said that is not true. He said all politics is local. Folks, all politics is not local. Our national security is not just local. Yes, there's a local component to it. You know, just down the road, we have Lockheed Martin and Dobbins Air Base, and they are going to be targeted, I guarantee you, they are going to be targeted within the next couple of years for closure. We fought that fight in 1995, and I was a proud member of the team that ensured that Dobbins survived as a major military reserve base, and with it, you know, its sister entity, Lockheed Martin, right across the runway. Go Bulldog Bar! Thank you, ma'am. They are gearing up for another round of brack cuts, and they will come. Keep and we have to have, open. we have to have folks in Washington, as my wife Jerry said, and she does not lie, I guarantee you that. She reminds me of that every day. What she said is absolutely correct. The issues facing us in Washington, whether they be economic, whether they be fiscal, whether they be tax, or whether they be national security issues such as ensuring that our base just down the road and the company that is the nation's, our nation's largest provider of military, military support, technology, and equipment remain open. We have to have people up there in Washington that know what they're doing. Here, here. We have to have people that know how to fight the enemies. I have fought Nancy Pelosi. Now the people in California keep sending her back. They won't do the job of reining her in. We will in Georgia through our congressional delegation in both sides, both the House and the Senate. I know Harry Reid. I fought him during the impeachment trial of William Jefferson Clinton in the Senate of the United States of America back in 1999. And he was a major reason why a president who violated his oath of office, obstructed justice, and committed perjury as found by a majority of members of the U.S. House of Representatives in public vote. Harry Reid was one of the main reasons that that man continued, despite that stain on his character, continued to serve as president. 
and we see unfolding out in Nevada, Harry Reid State right now, a potential very serious crisis. And I know as well as you do what can happen during these crises. We saw it at Ruby Ridge, we saw it at Waco, Texas, and I was part of the hearings that we had back in 1995 in which we brought to light what happened at Waco. Hopefully, we pray that we will not see something like that happen again. But we cannot simply leave it up to the people of other states. We cannot leave it up to those faceless bureaucrats in Washington whose only mission in life is to take power and freedom from us and put it in their hands in Washington. We have to follow these issues. We have to ensure that we have people on those key committees, as Jerry mentioned, particularly judiciary and government oversight, to make sure that there is accountability. To make sure, for example, and someone who understands this simple fact, that the true power in our government vests and resides in the House of Representatives if they choose to use it. Power unused is useless. As a matter of fact, it's worse than useless. When you have power and your adversary knows that you have it but you don't use it, that emboldens them to go further and further and further. When we have a president, as the current president is, somebody who believes that because he was elected nationally, he can do whatever he wants regardless of what the House of Representatives and the Senate and even the federal courts say, when you have that kind of a president, who practices what his buddy Rahm Emanuel said once, stroke of the pen, law of the land. The president signs a piece of paper, it's the law of the land. When you have that kind of president, you have to have, particularly in the House of Representatives, people, for example, who have served as Ronald Reagan's federal prosecutor here in the Northern District of Georgia, as I was honored to do for four years. Because those kind of people know, as I know, and have used these tools in the House before. The Congress does now have the tools to address these issues. Because Congress has the power of the purse strings. And they can attach a rider to any spending bill, including those that the President must have. For example, the spending bill that appropriates money for the running of the White House. President Obama cannot pay Jay Carney, the so-called press secretary, one dime that is not appropriated by the Congress in that appropriations bill that has the money wrapped up in it to run the White House. So if President Obama signs a piece of paper, an executive order or some other executive instrument that violates the law that dictates to federal employees that they will, for example, not follow our immigration laws and deport those take custody of and deport those who are arrested in this country for violations of our laws if they're here illegally. And the President dictates to his Attorney General and to the other federal bureaucrats, don't worry about that, don't enforce that law, don't enforce those regulations. When you have a President that does that, the Congress, if they have the backbone to do it, can attach a rider to that White House Appropriations Bill and say that no funds appropriate under this act can be used to carry out that particular executive order or other executive instrument. Then, if President Obama needs that money, then he's going to have to do one of two things. Tell the undertaker over in the Senate, Senator Reid, I need to have that bill through even though it has that provision in it that I don't like. Or, what we did eventually with President Clinton by refusing over and over and over again to pass the spending bills that he wanted. It forces him to the table to negotiate with the American people through their representatives in the House. That's how we got a balanced budget. That's how we got, as Jerry said, welfare reform. And we did those things, we balanced the budget at the same time as we cut taxes. It's the best example in modern history of how the economy will work if you follow the money. Not from the people of Washington, but back. We cut taxes, the economy grew, 
And we cut spending at the same time by denying President Clinton the ability to get any of his pet spending bills through, and the economy boomed and grew. Now we all know that you know several, several years later, you know we, we fell back into the doldrums of deficit spending. But I know that it can be done. We can turn those things around. I've been there. I've been a part of the team that does it. Go Bulldog Bar! Yes, ma'am. We need more Don't smile. than people who simply vote the right way. We need more than people who simply talk the talk. We need people who can move our conservative agenda forward. I've done it before. I ask for your vote to do it again. And I have signed the Highway 20 Coalition Pledge. And I've just talked about it. I signed it. Because that's where these decisions need to be made. Here. Not by some bureaucrats under the Gold Dome or up in Washington, even worse. But here in our communities. We used to live in a country in which the citizens, if they decided they needed and wanted to get and to spend their money to build a road from point A to point B, they did so. Now what do you have? You have a bunch of bureaucrats up at DOT, up at EPA, up at the Corps of Engineers, and down under the Gold Dome making those decisions, taking year after year after year to make those decisions, all the while increasing tremendously the cost of the taxpayers. So whether it's the Highway 20 project or other projects, I ask for your vote to get me back into that arena to fight and to win those battles, not just fight them, but to win them. And we will. We've done it before. We can do it again. Thank you all very much. but it looks cool. <laughs> do we, but do we have time for, for a couple of questions? Yeah, we've got time for a couple questions. of questions. No, you can't ask any of Jerry. You can't ask her. Any questions? They might. And I, I join, by the way, Mr. Chairman, join in uh, uh, thanking you for your service uh, and uh, offering uh, my prayers and my support uh, for your complete recovery. Lighter that you're here, and that you beat them. And that's what we want to do in Washington. We want to beat those forces that want to see us laid out dead. Because they ne they won't give up, and we can't give up either. Question, Jack. Um, yeah, I've heard a lot of the candidates talk, Bob, about uh, what they're going to do when they get up there to go fix everything. Aren't a lot of these things that they're talking about already in place, and you know how to activate them? It, it, it's it's you you probably said in in. 30 seconds what I've taken 20 minutes to say up here. And that is, and I said this when I was President Reagan's U.S. Attorney, we don't need more laws. We had plenty of laws back when I served as U.S. Attorney. We have more than enough laws now. What we need to be doing, whether it's going to our federal prosecutors or going to our congressmen or going to our senators, we need to be telling them, use the tools that you have. You don't need more tools. You don't need more laws to restrict what we're doing. Use the tools that are already there, whether it is that appropriations process, which does work. Just ask Bill Clinton. Again, here, here. We, did not, we did not allow a single spending bill that Bill Clinton sent up to the White House once we gained the majority in the House of Representatives. Not a single one. It forced him to deal with those fiscal issues on our terms, on the people's terms. Here, here. And the tools are there. And the three committees, as Jerry mentioned, that I will serve on again with the seniority that I had before, Judiciary Committee. Every pro-life issue, every constitutional issue comes through the Judiciary Committee. <laughs> Financial services. Every piece of legislation that deals with federal housing issues or financial issues. And I will guarantee you, I will make sure that repeal of Dodd-Frank comes through that committee. And then finally, the third committee that I served on was the Government Reform and Oversight, which has the broadest jurisdiction of any committee in the Congress. Because they have the responsibility which a lot of folks up in the House and the Senate sort of forget about. 
It is the responsibility of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee, which has jurisdiction over every government agency, every government office, every government commission, to ensure that they are operating within the letter and the intent of the law. That oversight responsibility is absolutely critical. So, Jack, you're absolutely right. Congress has the tools. We don't need to amend the Constitution to do that. We don't even need more laws. We simply need folks up there with what, and I suspect Jerry would tell you this, I've got back here some backbone to use the tools that are there to get the job done and right the wrongs in Washington. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Rubenbosses. Thank you, Mr. Melbourne.